Hello, everyone. My name is Michelle Angelo Rocha, and I'm a PhD candidate in the Department of Educational Leadership and Policy Studies at the University of South Florida. Today, I'm here with three special guests. They are Dr. Adrian Labi Sharif, Corey Egan, and Joshua Glazer, authors of the chapter Emergent Analysis Strategies for Making Sense of an Evolving Longitudinal Study, part of the book. Analyzing and Interpreting Qualitative Research after the interview that is in production right now with SAGE. Dr. Larry Sharif is a researcher at Manhattan Strategy Group and an Associate Scholar at the Learning Research and Development Center at the University of Pittsburgh. Dr. Jo Josh Glazer is an Associate Professor of Education Policy at George Washington University, and Dr. Corey Egan is a Research Associate at the George Washington University's Graduate School of Education and Human Development. Thank you so much for taking the time to come and talk to me today. How are you? Good. Yep, doing well. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us. Oh. Yeah, we're happy to be here. Oh, welcome. So could you share a little bit, uh, could you give us a little bit brief summary of your chapter? Um, sure. So um, the, the context of our study was, uh, for this chapter, was the Memphis Eye Zone. Um, and in part we were drawn, which is a turnaround, a, a set of turnaround schools in the state of Tennessee. Um, and in part we were drawn to the Eye Zone because um, it was outperforming a rival uh, turnaround program um, in the state that was led by charter management organizations. So Josh and co put together um, a proposal to investigate um, what was going on in the eye zone that was driving achievement. And so our initial research questions like focus in on what were the goals and strategies of the eye zone and how they were enacted. And to answer these questions, we interviewed uh, teachers, principals, um, principal supervisors and math coaches to understand the overall like theory of instruction and the, the theory of improvement um, that was in place. And we started to notice that like um, that through analysis of these interviews and through writing memos and through developing an initial code book that our initial research questions didn't quite fit. And so what we had at the end of two years was like, we developed a set of research questions that were more around what is the theory of shared uh, teaching and learning and what is the shared theory of improvement. Um, but by that point we had 150 plus interviews and we had already applied um, our code book to um, all of those 150 interviews. So we were placed in the dilemma of like, how do we, um, make sense of the data that we've already coded and then also how do we purposefully sample uh, the data to make uh, to uh, address the new research questions that we developed wow 150 is a lot of data <laughs> so how, uh, how is your chapter contributing to qualitative research um so i think a couple of things, contributions that are being made here that are um, are around um, how how what do you do when you've already developed a code book for one set of research questions that have developed over time, um, and so um, in order to do that, we had to come up with a whole set of methods to um, answer um, the the research questions that we had developed. Um, in subsequent years of the study. And then I think another thing that, um, another contribution of this chapter is that uh, we had to purposefully sample the data to recode because we had over 150 interviews. We couldn't, we didn't have uh, the personnel or the time um, to recode all 150 interviews. Um, so we had to develop a, a new coding scheme to apply to only a select set of, um, of the, the already coded excerpts. So we had to be really purposeful with that. And so we go into some of those details in the chapter about how we made those selections. Okay. Yeah, it, it um, tries to marry rigorous methods with certain realities of the research that might not show up in typical textbooks. So some of those realities are that your research questions change, your understanding of the topic change, 
your initial codes no longer seem like they fit that well. And in addition, you have limited resources, human resources and time. So you can't go back and, 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 and recode all your data. That's just not always realistic. And so then how do you sort of make certain compromises without really you know, weakening or detracting from the methodological rigor of your study. So I, I think the chapter really tries to sort of be grounded in the reality of the work. Thank you. And what do, you, do your readers expect to learn from your chapter? Um, uh, yeah, I think along those lines, Josh, did you want to go ahead? No, I thought Corey's going to answer, but fine. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Corey. Well, I was just going to say that, I mean, I think what's great about it is kind of what Josh said. I mean, it does walk you through some of these realities that you don't get to see when you're reading research. I think when we were meeting with some students in your class the other day, someone said, we've read research um, that showed that people, you know, they made researchers, wrote the research questions, and then they never changed, you know, throughout the whole process, or it didn't seem as if they did. And so I think like Josh said, this is just more realistic and we also walk through from the beginning to the very end, like we have a very detailed section on memoing as well. So I think we walk you through the whole process, um, which is really nice. And um, yeah, especially given that we had so much data, you know, tens of thousands of pages of transcripts. Wow. And do you have like an advice for emergent or more advanced qualitative researchers who has a lot of data and uh, how to, if you have advice based on your experience? Advice for more advanced researchers? And, and new scholars too, like me, for example. <laughs> um, yeah, sure. Um, uh, pl plenty of advice. I mean, I can start, but then let Adrian and Corey um, chime in. I mean, I think um, one of the decisions that we made was that we were not going to be able to rely on our own sort of informal narratives and analysis in our heads. So, you know, when you're doing this work, particularly qualitative research, you start to develop a story or an analysis while the research is taking place. And you can easily sort of get more and more wedded and committed to that particular analysis. But when you have a study um, that is either being run by a whole team of people who have shared the, the work of, of collecting and analyzing data, when you have a very large database, when it's a longitudinal study that's taking place over years, that's too much data to keep in your head. And you have to really sort of, I think, um, fight the tendency to go with the narrative that's just in your head and assume that there are um, elements of the data, there are things that were learned, there are potential analyses, which are too much just for these sort of informal sense-making processes. And that's when you really have to rely on these more formal analytic methods that in a sense allow you to challenge your pre-existing notion of what you think you're learning. Um, I think there's a certain modesty and humility built into that way of working, which says I may not understand my data as, as well as I think I do. Um, and no, mo no one member of my team of, or of the team may fully understand it. So that would be one piece of advice. Just be, be skeptical about your own ability to informally, implicitly know your own data. Thank you. Do you have more on um, just... Um... Yeah, I, I think um, like on a on a different note, I think I would uh, found a lot of value in this project in doing qualitative research in a team, um, and that's not that's um, an opportunity that I didn't have when I was a doctoral student. But I found it to be really helpful to develop a code book with a team of people where we could like check our own biases and assumptions and also use different perspectives to strengthen our code book. 
And then that also like helps in the whole messiness of qualitative research, because then when you're digging into the data, you have a team of people you can bounce ideas off of and you can write initial memos and be like, what do you think about this? And like, you can have people like agree with your ideas or push back on your ideas or add to your ideas. And so I think um, as much as possible, like the opportunity to code and do qualitative research in teams is a very beneficial experience. <laughs> Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. And I can't wait to read your chapter because it's going to help with my own research. And I can't wait people read um, uh, emergent scholars or more advanced. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having thank us. Thank you so much, Michelle. You're welcome.